Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, if you don't know me already, my name is Haruka Radabush. I'm the Senior Programs Manager at the Japanese Cultural and Community Center of Northern California. And we're based in San Francisco's Japantown. And um, obviously you guys are here for our, um, our panel discussion following our screening of the Being Japanese documentary uh, made by filmmaker Greg Lamb from YouTube channel Life Where I'm From. And we're joined here today on our panel, uh, along with Greg, we have uh, two subjects from the film. Uh, we have Elena Nielsen, who is uh, also a staff member here at the center uh, in San Francisco. So uh, hi, Elena. And then we also have Bobby Koitu, who uh, you saw in the film as well. Hello. Um, and so uh, we're going to go ahead and get everyone spotlighted here. Um, and let's see. So for our um, program today, our discussion panel, uh, we want to, um, you know, give you guys a chance to sort of explain um, your own take on uh, not only the the topic that was presented in the film of uh, Japanese identity, uh, but also your your personal stories and connection to the topic as well. And so I think um, for our uh, panel discussion today, we'll sort of introduce you guys by having you guys tell us about yourselves um, and then also discuss your um, own identities, uh, beginning with, you know, when you first became aware uh, that you were Japanese and then um, sort of go into um, how that understanding may have evolved over time to uh, your current understanding of your own identity. But uh, before we, we get into that, I know that people who watch the, the screening um, also might have some questions for you guys that came up throughout uh, the film or um, that might come up in the course of listening to you guys on our panel here today. So uh, for folks in the audience, if you do have any questions for us all, uh, go ahead and put those into the chat on the webinar or the Q&A function um, to, on the bottom of your screens. And uh, as we get to the audience Q&A portion, uh, we'll read them aloud for everyone to um, answer. But uh, in the meantime, uh, we hope you do enjoy uh, today's panel discussion. And so with that, why don't we start with Greg, uh, if you could uh, go into uh, your own identity, your awareness of it, and um, you know how it may have evolved to uh, your current understanding. Okay, hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, this might be a repeat of the intro a couple hours ago, but I don't know how many people were actually here a couple hours ago. Um, but yeah, basically for me, I am half British, half Chinese. That's a simplified version of all my different identities. But I was born and raised in Canada, so I'm pretty much just Canadian. I can't speak Chinese, um, don't eat much Chinese food. Uh, British, I drink some tea, so I have some tea over here, but <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pretty much Canadian. But in, in Canada, I can call myself, my, myself Canadian, like 100%, no one questions that, as you heard in the documentary. It's, it's very simple for me, but I can also tell people that I am multiple different things. and generally it's accepted but i guess one of the things that happened when i was a teenager was that um in winnipeg it's like 90 percent let's say whitish and um the rest are called visible minorities and i was part of the visible minority so i was kind of like one of the few asian kids in school so that was kind of my identity even though i didn't do many asian things um it wasn't more specific like you weren't like chinese or japanese or vietnamese you're just asian but i moved to vancouver when i was 19 years old and over there i suddenly wasn't asian anymore i was a white guy and um especially with uh people who recently came from china they even see my last name which is lam l-a-m which is a chinese last name and they recognize that and they're like why do you have a chinese last name and i say yeah i'm half chinese they're like no you're not and um like a lot of people with the Japanese American community, I think they've had similar feelings as well or similar situations. Um, but I think the one thing that is different between me and most of the interviewees is that I always felt I could just say I'm Canadian. Like I always had that identity. No one could ever, no one ever questioned that. Never one ever tried to take it away from me. And so 
I was pretty fine with that. But with my kids, um, my wife is Japanese and I'm Canadian. So our kids are both Japanese and Canadian. And they've grown up in both Canada and Japan almost equal years, actually, like half and half of the time. So um, right now they're probably culturally more Japanese because they've lived in Japan for the more recent years, um, the more formative years, I would say. Um, but yeah, I guess that's why I, that's some of the reasons I made the documentary. One is kind of like, oh, my own identity, but then going to Japan and realizing how it's not as simple for my kids to be like, oh yeah, I'm Canadian or I'm Japanese. They just can't say I'm Japanese as easily as I can say I'm Canadian. And I wondered why is that? So that's kind of my little intro. Great. Thanks, Greg. Um, why don't we hear next from, from Bobby? How about yourself and your uh, journey with identity? Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, I would say, like, so I was born in Japan and quickly, like, moved to America uh, before I could even really talk. So then I went back to Japan every summer because I have family there. So to me, it was just the most natural thing, I guess. <laughs> Very spoiled lifestyle, I guess, right? Because you spend summers in Japan and then you spend the rest of the year in America. So it just seemed to me like, you know, oh yeah, the airport is just like another part of my life or world. So I was like, yeah, okay. I'm Japanese when it's hot and I'm American when it's cold in Vermont. <laughs> It just seemed, honestly, it was like really as simple as that when I was a kid. And then when I was growing up, I think that's when, because Vermont is, for those of you who've never been, you know, it's very mostly white and yeah, it's not that, that diverse. And so I grew up in a really small town in Vermont called Newport, 5,000 people. So it was literally like our family, half Japanese. And one of the Chinese family, that was it. So I think because of that, I had a pretty strong, like, maybe like I was trying to compensate or something to try to hold on or stand out with my Japanese side. And then uh, when I went to Japan, it was the opposite. Like I was really proud of being like American. Yeah, among my, because I used to go to school for the summertime. So it was kind of like trying to have the best of both worlds, but it's kind of in hindsight, it's like, well, definitely what a kid would do, I think. <laughs> Try to have everything, but like not really take responsibility for like either. Yeah, I think as an adult, I'm just kind of like, mm, yeah, I really don't identify 100% either way. I'm just kind of like, I live wherever I am legally and then like uh, as long as I can be he healthy and happy then like I'll join whatever group is there so okay great thank you Bobby um why don't we go to Elena then how about you Elena hi everyone uh, I'm Haruka and um nice to meet you Bobby and Mikashi Budi Greg um so about me, um, so like I am half Japanese American, fourth generation. So my great grandparents um, immigrated um, from Japan to America. Um, and I grew up, I was born in Los Angeles, um, which is pretty ethnically diverse, right? Um, but I moved at a very young age to um, Northern California to a suburb that is like, the Bay Area is pretty diverse, um, but the suburb that I went to, the specific town, was not, um, it was mostly white. And um, I think my mom was really worried about me getting bullied like she was um, at, um, when she was younger, um, she also, was at a very kind of white school and she got bullied a lot because um people still had a kind of bitterness about um world war ii um, and japanese people 
Um, so I think she was afraid of that happening to me and she was afraid of me being like, ashamed of being um, Japanese American. So from a very young age, I was hearing all about um, like Japanese American history. I think I was in kindergarten, I heard about, um, you know, the incarceration. Um, so I am, um, yeah, I was always raised to try to be like proud of like my culture. Um, um, but people were mostly, you know, nice to me growing up. It, it just, there's, it's not that people were like bullying me. It was more just, you feel like a difference sometimes. Um, like I was raised Buddhist and pretty much everyone around me was Christian. Um, so I wouldn't go to like the same kind of church that churches around that everyone would go to. Um, if anything Japanese or Buddhist came up in class, like the teacher would like, oh, Lena. <laughs> um, it didn't come up often, but it's just, you feel like there's this kind of difference. Like you're seen as maybe kind of like what Greg was saying, it's like you're seen as the Asian one or um, the the representative of that, <laughs> of like Asian-ness. Um, which is funny because then you go to, I went to Japan eventually and it's, you're not, you're seen for that other side of you. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess um, when I was in Japan, um, I really thought, you know, like I could be, I could connect with that other, you know, Japanese side of myself. Um, and um, it was, it was strange not, like trying to talk with Japanese people and then not knowing about like Nikkei history or Japanese American identity or trying to just tell me I was American um, when I think, you know, my, all of my grandparents' lives, they've had to deal with the issue of being not American enough. My mom's life, throughout her life, she's had to deal with the issue of not being American enough. Me even, you know, I, not to the same extent, but, I know that my life was impacted in some ways, um, not feeling like a part of that community completely that I grew up in. Um, so when I went to Japan and I would try to, you know, talk with people and then I wouldn't be Japanese enough <laughs> or um, people wouldn't know what Japanese American is, it's, it's kind of a confusing thing, which is why, you know, me and my friends, we started our Nikkei group, Nikkei in Japan and Greg came out and, you know, we really appreciated you coming out and, you know, listening to our stories and taking an interest in what we have to say and not just trying to, you know, dismissing it as you're just, you know, American or you're just um, Japanese, but really trying to like hear our story um, as Japanese Americans as Nikkei. Great, thanks. Elena, um, so I have an, a follow-up question for you all, um, and that would be on um, sort of this um, idea that uh, Japan is uh, gradually becoming a more multicultural society at this point, right? Um, where um, the documentary, um, you know, covers a whole a multitude of different folks that um, have very complex identities. They're not just Japanese, right? We have folks that are, in some cases, uh, like some of yourselves, like multi-ethnic or um, might be transnational. And um, that might go against, I guess, Japan's own history of trying to be uh, culturally homogenous to some extent, right? Um, and so my question for you guys is, um, having spent time living in Japan, um, do you feel that at this point, Japan society is becoming more acclimated to the idea that there are people with hybrid identities uh, that aren't just, um, you know, that are challenging this, this notion that um, Japan uh, or Japanese identity is a singular thing? Uh, Greg, why don't we start with you? Yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> That'll be easy to start off. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a complicated issue or question, I think, and it depends who you talk to and especially maybe what 
um, era you're from or what age range you're in. Um, personal experience with my family in Japan is I think my kids mostly kind of blended in into school. Um, you know, some people they point out that they're different, but nothing at all like some of the stories we heard in the documentary. So as far as I could tell, if, you know, there was like, oh, you're different, it's, it seemed pretty minor. And when I talk to other kids and, and see other parts, and I'm talking about Tokyo, which has a lot of diversification in comparison to the rest of Japan, um, I think people are getting more and more used to just having a, a diversity of people within Japan. Now, when you actually think about, okay, but who is Japanese? Are, are my kids Japanese? Are, are these other kids Japanese, even if they're born and raised in Japan? Um, whether or not they have Japanese parents, are one of their parents are Japan, Japanese? That's, I think it's still, I mean, it, it's not quite there, I would say, or not, not, not close to there. And I think that's partly, I've been thinking about it because I, I've, moved, I've moved to Canada like three months ago and um, just seeing what they teach in the school, like every single like messaging from the school, they're always talking about diversity. Like, you know, everyone's Canadian. We're all in this together. You know, we celebrate, you know, everyone's, you know, different ways of doing things, different ways of looking, different languages, different ways of being, different beliefs, like everything it's reinforced like again and again and again. So it's kind of hard to get away from, you know, that diversity is good, at least in the, you know, education system where we are in, in Canada. And I felt like that's what I grew up with, like, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, going through the education system. So it's just kind of like built into the, you know, Canadian value system or DNA where, and, and the same as on, you know, um, the broadcasting and whatnot, uh, they say that as well, but in Japan, uh, especially like uh, you know, like the TV or the education system, you know, they, they recognize people are from different countries, but they just don't seem to recognize that Japanese people can actually speak different languages, or that they can look, you know, different than the typical Japanese, or that they can be Japanese and something else. Um, it still feels like there's so, such a long way to go to get to that point. Um, but I think which some of the other panelists will say, and which a lot of interviewees said, uh, people like Rui Hachimura or especially like Naomi Osaka, they're really helping to push, like, um, be the face of like diversity in Japan and kind of like bring that topic forward. So everybody's like really talking about it and thinking about it. So, um, I feel bad for what they have to go through personally, because I feel it must be so tough to go through every day, people questioning their identity and who they are and whether or not they're really Japanese and this kind of stuff. Um, but I'm really, I, I know I'm not Japanese, but I'm really proud of them for, for being that face and for taking it. And I know it must be so tough for them to do that every single day in the spotlight, but I think they're doing great work just being themselves. All right. Thanks, Greg. Uh, how about um, Elena? What's your take on this? Um, well, I think, you know, it depends on the person, right? Um, There's some people who are obviously, they know more, they're more um, like cognizant of um, maybe they've been abroad. So they know like Japanese identity can be more like um, complicated or um, identity itself can be more complicated. Um, so I don't want to generalize about Japan and in general. Um, there have been some times when I'm talking with someone and they actually know, like, they know about Nikkei people, you know, and I'm like, oh, that's a surprise. Um, so, and I, I do agree with uh, Greg that I think um, people like Naomi Osaka and Rui Hachimura, like, they really are um, helping to usher in a lot more awareness of what it means not only to be like Japanese but to be uh hafu I think um Tetsuro in the film he talked about how when people think of a hafu they think of someone who is um half white I've I've spoken with him before and he said a lot of them think of um there's this television personality called I think Becky um and she's half white um half Japanese very um 
very traditionally kind of attractive looking. Um, and I think that's kind of the image people have of mixed race um, um, or even slightly non-Japanese, uh, but Japanese people. Um, but I think, you know, people like Naomi um, and Rui, they're helping to show like, you know, not just how we don't just look like this, you know, we have, it's much more I, diverse um, range of people. Um, I think in general, Hafu, um, sometimes I would go by Hafu. You know, I'm actually, you know, Nikkei, right? Um, half Nikkei, but I would go by Hafu because Hafu just, it communicates easier. I'm not sure why that is, but um, maybe because of like television personalities, but Japanese people seem to much like more easily understand um, why you're foreign if you're half if you why you're kind of different from like the standard Japanese if you're half genetically Japanese and something else like that communicates better than saying I'm Nikkei um, I don't know if that's other people's experience uh -huh. I guess uh we'll go to, to Bobby next then um do you see uh Japanese society being able to understand better the distinctions between uh, individuals like ethnicity and race the, versus like their nationality and citizenship or their cultural identity? Yeah, um, well first like I was reading some of the comments and I'm not sure if my audio got better or not, but yeah, I hope it's better now. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Um, yeah, I think it's kind of like what Greg was touching on is um, there hasn't really been like this large national dialogue at least like for a long time maybe recently it started but uh i it's interesting my oldest brother he was born in 82 so when he was born like if you weren't both if your parents aren't both japanese or i think if your father isn't japanese you couldn't have japanese citizenship uh whereas when i was born i think it was that year like, it didn't matter. Like, your mom could be Japanese, your dad could be, like, Canadian, whatever. You could have... I'll just step in and insist that the father in 1985. Right. Before that, yeah. Yeah. So, that was, you know, that's just in my lifetime, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So, like, that's very telling of how, whether it's um, law or, like, ethics or, you know, views on state, nation, identity. Like, Japan's still evolving. And yeah, I think like it'll catch up. I don't know. <laughs> like, I think Japan will change and become a bit more open-minded inevitably because of uh, I think the growing, you know, Vietnamese, um, Chinese, Filipino like communities in Japan. And I think yeah, eventually there will be integration. It's just that it won't be easy. Like I think there'll be a lot of hardship and a lot of a lot of people that are gonna have to fight for their. Uh, identities and rights. And mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see in the next 20, 30 years what happens. Sure. Um, so yeah, I, I think that kind of segues very neatly into um, the next question for the panel here. Um, and that is a reflection on the, the current policies in Japan, right? So uh, right now there actually isn't um, a, a blanket national immigration policy uh, in Japan, right? So. Um, I think it's kind of on a case-by-case -case basis, especially when it comes to issues of like naturalization, um, who can become a citizen. Um, uh, unfortunately, there are um, certainly cases too where there are people born in Japan but who have a, an other uh, ethnic origin, right, in their ancestry that, uh, like the Zainichi Koreans who may be uh, denied uh, citizenship to Japan even though they were born there. Um, so do you feel, um, and I, I think Bobby, you, you kind of already answered a little bit um, about this, but uh, do you feel like this is something uh, that the Japanese government is going to change, um, you know, in the foreseeable future uh, or adopt an actual policy that uh, kind of creates a pathway for um, people to become Japanese citizens, whether or not they're, uh, you know, foreign born, um, you know, maybe they're Nikkei or they, they might be, uh, say, like refugees, right, that um, have entered the country. 
um, where do you guys see um, Japan's policies um, kind of evolving? Also, like, I, I wasn't sure, like, when to pop in and out. So I'm just <laughs> <Yeah>. gonna, like, <laughs> go ahead. All right, yeah. Um, yeah, so I just read this book called Pachinko. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. Yeah, um, yeah. It's a, uh, it was just really interesting and eye opening. Because um, yeah, I'd heard about Zainichi and, you know, I have friends who are, but that specific storytelling method of like you know going before war world war ii and then past world war ii all the way towards the 80s it really was like it makes the concept like that much stronger i think in your head where um you know some of my favorite places in my hometown in nagoya like were run by zainichi and it was just interesting thinking about everything that my family said about them and um yeah it was just like I guess the concept of like the Zainichi to me is still very like it's kind of hard to accept I guess because of how ridiculous it is um, but it's just the reality of it right it's, it's still a problem and um, the thing about Koreans is that maybe uh, they for better or for worse they can blend in physically like a lot of times it's a bit harder to tell if you're Zainichi or not. Um, and you can change your name. And just by your name, you probably know if they're like Kanayama or like Hoshino or something like you You can assume that's like, oh, they're probably Zainichi. But at least it sounds Japanese and you can look Japanese and you can integrate sort of seamlessly. But it's sort of like, I don't know, it's like it festers because you can't see it. And people just assume it's okay. Mm -hmm. But you know, Japan, like they don't really want to ad admit <laughs> or like acknowledge anything that's wrong. Yeah. Um, so it just continues. But like with Vietnamese people, for example, it's a lot harder to like just uh, ignore because mm -hmm. physically there might be something different um, or atypical. And then the sounds and the, their names and everything, it, it's like a telltale. It's like, oh, you could be third generation maybe but people will still be like oh you're tran or you're nguyen so like so i think it'll be um from what the japanese government has done so far to try to integrate vietnamese and thai workers and stuff mm -hmm. and cambodians uh it's not encouraging because they're not incentivizing them to stay here long term they're not proposing like housing uh subsidies or anything like that for people who come here on those this learning visas <laughs> so um i'm not like trying to be naive but i do think that generally speaking immigrants who come to these whether it's japan or america or like germany like refugees or immigrants they tend to integrate incredibly well as long as there's awareness and some legislative change mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, in the next 20, 30 years, there will be a change, but it'll, like I said, it's just going to be really hard and it won't come overnight. Mm -hmm. Elena or Greg, do you guys have any uh, thoughts on the policies of Japan? Well, I was just thinking, like, I would be interested to see the differences or similarities and experiences uh, between, like, say, um, that English man who uh, got Japanese citizenship versus, you know, a refugee from, say, Myanmar or um, the Zainichi Korean people just who've been there for so, you know, been in Japan for so long, but are still not considered Japanese. Like, um, it just it seems interesting. Um, I just is interesting to me watching the film, like hearing, you know, the Zainichi Korean uh, people talk about how it's, they felt like they had to keep it hidden. And um, I guess it partially has to do with like, they, they can keep it hidden based on like, you know, looking similar to Japanese people um, versus say um, the English man who became a Japanese citizen. And um, it, it, he didn't seem to have 
um, he also can't hide, you know, how he looks, right? Mm -hmm. He's visibly different, but it just, it would be interesting to hear more about like, I guess, contrasting their experiences. Maybe Greg has more insight on that. <laughs> I feel like I could really talk a lot about it. So I'm going to try to limit myself on how much I talk because um, a part of the documentary was supposed to be about, you know, the, the future of Japan. What, what is it going to look like 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the road? Mm -hmm. So I'd interviewed people about that. I went to the Philippines to talk to people who are coming to Japan and why. Mm -hmm. And then actually I went to film with Bobby even like, you know, talking to some people or trying to talk to some people. And I went to different areas, um, even with uh, Nikkei Brazilians, mm -hmm. right, who are more recently came back to Japan after being away for a generation or two. So a lot more recent experience of trying to integrate into Japanese society than the Zainichi Koreans uh, that I was talking to. Um, but where to start? So like from a law point of view, um, yeah, it does really feel like, interestingly, it's, Japan's very open in terms of being able to immigrate if you are a uh, professional worker, if you're educated, it's actually really easy to get into Japan and then uh, become a citizen if you're willing to give up your other citizenship uh, and go all into Japan. That only takes five years, whereas permanent residency for, for the typical situation would take 10 years. Mm -hmm. I became permanent resident after a few years because I've been married to a Japanese citizen for a long time. So it's a different path. Um, but like Bobby was saying about uh, like the Vietnamese people that are coming or the Filipino people coming or Thai people from um, like from countries that are not as developed and maybe they're not as educated. They're coming here under un to Japan under different work visas and their path. They don't really have a great path to citizenship. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's not a, an official policy, but basically it's built so that you go to Japan, you do your three years or your five years, then you go back to your country right? It's not really designed to have them come and stay. Um, part of that is that they can't normally bring their families along. So <laughs> if you're going to a different country that you don't know the culture of, you don't speak the language, and you can't bring your family with you, I mean, the strategy would be like economic then. You're just going there, making your money, then coming back. So when you go to Japan, you're not even trying to really integrate because what's the point? You can't even become Japanese if you wanted to. Um, so unless they started really changing it to try to encourage people like, yes, bring your families, like Bob was saying, like, yeah, like have some housing policies because there's so many, uh, derelict or, um, akiyas, which are like houses that are no one, are, no one is occupying in Japan, especially the countryside where they need a lot of workers. Like, why don't you take advantage of that and have more, you know, people who would love to take this advantage, this opportunity and come to Japan and start a life, but there's just not that support from the government. And I think was it maybe a year ago, maybe two years ago in the news, I, I read about welcome centers. Mm -hmm. And welcome centers is kind of the concept that someone new to Japan could go to the center and they're going to get help, like really basic stuff, which always comes up for people not from Japan is like, like how to do your garbage, right? All the waste and how to sort <laughs> everything properly, yeah. stuff like that. Or maybe like, but like how to sign up for your healthcare card, how to pay your taxes, how to, you know, go grocery shopping, like really how to take the public transport system, basic stuff like that, where in Canada, we've had welcome centers for as long as I can remember. And, um, and there'd be multiples, you know, in, in every single city, I would think any, any major city. And so I think we haven't really set up to encourage immigrants. We're always told that immigrants are great for Canada. Like that's always like the government's line. Mm -hmm. We argue about how many immigrants to let in, but I think it's like nearly 1% of the Canadian population becomes like a new immigrant every single year, right? You get 1% one more, 1 more. So every year is like 300,000 roughly or so. Um, in Japan, there's, there's not that conversation at all. It's not even close. Um, be like, because, you know, like Haruka was saying, there is no official immigration policy. Um, and I think it's kind of like they're, you know, just kind of don't touch it and nothing happens. Maybe politically nothing happens to you if you don't have like a really firm stance on it. And if you don't like kind of 
tell the public about some official immigration policy, then no one gets mad. And, you know, everything's kind of harmonious. But I think there's only so long it can go without doing something official. Because the last stat I looked at, there's about 3 million um, foreign residents in Japan. And that's a major increase. I think maybe like 20 years ago, and I'm probably wrong in the stats, but it was like a million. So it's definitely increasing. And just the way it's going, it's either like you have to do something to help, you know, keep the whole Japanese economy and system going. So you either need to have like robots cover, you know, like the workers, you need robotics to cover it, automation to cover it, or you need, you know, humans. And the birth rate is not high enough in Japan to do it that way. So you're kind of left with immigration. And right now they're covering in that with just temporary foreign residents mostly. But, you know, are they ever going to change it where it's going to be? No, like, let's make them permanent residents. To me, it it would seem to make sense to be permanent residents and citizens because then you're training all these people. And like after five years, if they really do fit into Japan, they want to live in Japan, they want to have their family in Japan, then like, it seems like such a waste to like have them go back to their country and (laughs) you're trying to, you know, train a new fresh batch to come in and replace them. Like, Mm -hmm. why not keep these people who are really, you know, invested in Japan, who are interested in Japan. Um, But I'll just say one, one last thing is they made these new visa types. And again, this is probably about a year ago or two years ago when they announced it. I think it just got implemented last year. And I know with the whole pandemic kind of like messed things up, but they did have some pathways to start becoming Japanese. It wasn't very easy, but they had some pathways to come to Japan easier and become Japanese easier, become permanent resident easier. But the last latest news report that I read, and this is probably like six months ago or a year ago, were saying that like <laughs> the pickup on these programs were so low. You're, like, you're talking about maybe a thousand people or two thousand people went into this program where they were thinking like a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, or three hundred thousand. Uh, so they got like a fraction of what they thought they would get under these programs. So it's definitely a long ways to go in terms of figuring out the immigration policy. Right. Thank you, Greg. Um, so I think that uh, you mentioned um, earlier um, about the Japanese Brazilians who have uh, started, um, uh, I guess, uh, migrating back to Japan um, as um, labor. And so my next question kind of gets into that a little bit uh, as far as uh, members of the Nikkei diaspora, right, uh, folks who are part of the global community of people of Japanese descent, right? So that could include uh, Japanese Americans, and I know we have several Japanese Americans in our audience today. Um, the, the center's uh, biggest constituency uh, here in the States, at least, is Japanese Americans, right, at this point. Sansei or Yonsei, third or fourth generation uh, Japanese Americans. And I know that Elena, um, you know, in particular, you know, kind of uh, grappled with her Nikkei identity while she was uh, living in Japan as well. But I guess my question for panelists uh, is uh, how much awareness is there in Japan of our Nikkei communities, you know, that exist outside of Japan, but, you know, you know, we have folks out in the world and whole communities of Japanese descent. And uh, is there any sense of a connection between uh, people that are part of like, you know, mainstream Japanese society and uh, these uh, Nikkei communities that exist elsewhere? Um, I, I've never really, I don't think there is much of a consciousness in Japan for that. I think their existence is like known, but um, yeah, I think it's largely like, oh, I guess they exist and they can come here if they want to. <laughs> like, I think that's the general impression that I get, um, which contrasts somewhat to like my Korean friends uh, who, when she said that she was traveling to Vietnam or something and she found like a North Korean community at a bar mm-hmm. and they just like, once they met, they just like hugged and danced and cried and like embraced. And they were just like, Oh yeah. Like my brothers and sisters. And I was just like, wow, like I've definitely never seen that in Japan. Like, <laughs> like, um, so that I think is really telling like of how it's like, once you leave Japan, like you're just, I feel like they're just like, oh, Okay. You're not Japanese. Like, 
Um, I think, you know, my experience, I think slightly older people tend to be more, they're more likely to know about Nikkei than younger people for whatever reason. Um, like I remember one of my students, I was an English teacher. Um, and I remember one of my high school students, I had to explain to her like, what Nikkei was and I had to like make like a little like family tree chart like of my ancestry and I was like okay here are my grandparents <laughs> and then I'd write in Japanese grandparent and then English because I was trying to, teach, trying to teach her English too I'd write grandparent <laughs> and then I'd be like and then there's my my um my great-grandparents my you know my mom there's me and <laughs> and she's still like I think her her uh, comment was oh your family is really complicated like that was her comment like after I I showed it to her um but um yeah, I and I know there's a museum in Yokohama for Nikkei too. I don't mm -hmm. know if anyone has been. Um, I think it's talked about in the film briefly. It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I've had a couple nice moments with Japanese people, like born and raised Japanese people, when there's something that's like there's a connection kind of made, and then there's there's like a oh like you know this like um. I was in this, um, so this, the foreign English teachers um, had like this little, um, like, kind of like, um, what is it, Japanese dance? Um, kind of like Yosakoi. Um, we had like a little Yosakoi team for this festival, and I was part of that. And this uh, group of like Obachans and Ojichans, they were teaching us how to do this dance. And, um, I was talking with them and I was talking about how every year growing up as a Japanese American, I would do bonodori, right? Um, in America. And we we're talking about different songs and I forget what song it was, but I think it was like, uh, gosh, what was it? Tankobushi, Tankobushi. And they knew Tankobushi and they were so excited that I knew Tankobushi. And <laughs> so we, they were like, oh, wait, we have it. And they had this little CD player and they started playing this the song and then we all started uh, dancing this song. And the other um, English teachers I was with, they're like, what is this? And we're just like, it's me and like these old Japanese people doing this dance. So it was, you know, there are moments like that, you know, there's the bad moments too, when you can tell like, you're not like people don't see who you are, right? Um, but yeah, there's been a couple of moments like that where it's just, there's a connection. And I I really appreciate all those moments I was able to have in Japan. Mm -hmm. They mean so much to me. Sure. So I guess, Elena, um, the documentary kind of uh, alluded to you being part of the, the Nikkei in Japan group, right? But can you tell us a little bit more about um, the group and uh, you can even plug it a little bit if you'd like but um, you know just sort of the, the commonalities that members of the group found uh, in their experiences being Nikkei in Japan um well I mean our group hasn't been so active recently since you know I've been in America but when we first started um, I really missed my Nikkei community right um because of, you know, what we had been going through, um, you know, over generations in America, right? I feel like we've kind of created like our own little kind of insular community, right? Where it's like, you don't have to be American, you don't have to be Japanese, you can be Japanese American, right? That's what Japantown is, SF Japantown is, um, to me. Um, and so I miss that, I miss having this little space where it's just like, my identity is just like immediately understood. Um, and so I was talking to my friend who's a Kikoku Shijo and she had always kind of been in between, right? She, even Japan, she wasn't Japanese enough. America, she wasn't, you know, American enough. And so she's like, that's a really cool thing. I never heard of like a Japan town and or a Japanese American community. So she's like, let's create it here. And so we just, you know, reached out across Facebook and um, 
we're saying we're creating a space for people who aren't who are Japanese but like not Japanese enough um and um yeah we got some people together it was and we would have these meetings every month um where we would ask each other we would write down on these little cards a question for the group um it would be something like gosh I'm trying to think of an example um like maybe you you were having trouble um communicating with your Japanese coworkers. you felt like maybe you felt like like even though you could speak Japanese like you weren't they saw you as different so you'd write a question to the group um like saying how do you connect with your Japanese coworkers? or um a question like um does does Japan feel like home to you? And we put them all together and we pick out a random card and you you'd answer someone's question. So it was it was like these we would get dinner and then we would have these little like question sessions where we would just kind of validate each other, you know? Because mm -hmm. sometimes you'd ask a question, you think, oh, this is just me, but then someone else would be like, Oh, I felt that same way. <laughs> I've had that same problem. So that's what the group was about. Um and the funny thing was, as we kept having these meetings, you know, I thought it would just be people who are Japanese American, or um, but we started getting more Kikoku Shijo people, and we started getting like people from all different backgrounds, because um, there's there's so many people who don't fit into that narrow definition of what is Japanese, right? There's so many people in Japan who feel like I, I'm I don't fit that mold. So seeing that, I can only hope that, you know, Japan is definitely going to become more international um, because there's more and more of us who don't really fit. So I think we're definitely going to have, it has to go somewhere. <laughs> Our story, who we are has to go somewhere. And I think this film is a good example of that. Yeah. So, and I guess uh, going off of that then for uh, Bobby and Greg, I guess my question for you guys is, um, you know, especially in the course of, um, you know, making this film and, and interviewing different people that have complex identities that don't just fit this, you know, uh, standard uh, sort of textbook definition of what, you know, a Japanese person is like when you come across other people that don't necessarily fit the textbook de description of a Japanese person, is there a sort of a sense of like a camaraderie or a shared understanding that is sort of immediate when, when you guys start discussing these things? Yeah, um, I think there is a sense of it, yeah. Like, I think when I was younger though, especially, actually it's funny that's when I say I'm younger, like, when, when I first talked to Greg, I was like, wow, that was years ago, man. My hair was so much, so short. But uh, yeah, I think I felt even more of it, you know, especially during my formative years too. Um, right now, I guess I just feel old. <laughs> like, I'm just like, whenever, whenever I like see like, you know, my friends, kids are like, you know, growing up mixed and and um you know if i hear about their stories i'm just kind of like yeah yeah it sounds familiar yeah and like i don't necessarily feel uh, validated so to speak it's more like i feel kind of privileged to just empathize with them to just being like okay yeah no that's fine you know that's how you feel is totally legitimate and real and uh i just want as happy as it sounds like I, I kind of want people to almost embrace some of their identity struggles because uh, I think it's almost sad <laughs> to, like when people don't think about their identities when they don't really have like a because I've met people who are like I mean it's kind of funny but like it'll be like uh yeah like I'm just like uh, lost Irish white like those are like I have no idea what I am like <laughs> like I just think it's so funny because it's like yeah I guess yeah because I mean they just immigrated and maybe their families didn't want to maintain traditions and they just wanted to integrate be American mm -hmm. and then they have no 
cultural heritage anymore because they just lost it. Mm -hmm. And then, so as as complicated as it can be and as uh, harsh as sometimes it can feel, I think it's nice to have that like conflict within you sometimes. And uh, yeah, so if I meet other people with similar experiences or views or problems, I just feel like, oh yeah, that's nice. <laughs> Yeah, um, filming and interviewing people, um, even though I'm, not, again, not at all Japanese, but I have a you know mixed uh, like roots, background, mixed heritage, mixed culture, whatever. Um, I was surprised at how much I could connect and um, with all, so many different people that I was talking to. I can I really understand like what they were going through. And the more I talked with people, like the easier it became like, oh yeah, yeah, I've heard this before. This person said that. Yeah, I've heard this person say this before. And even though like, you know, people of different, you know, life stages, different backgrounds and whatnot, upbringings, um, you can kind of see this common thread between everybody interviewed in the documentary. It was quite fascinating to see. Um, yeah. I guess the other thing I was just thinking about, though, is like with, with this talk, but also with the documentary and some feedback I've gotten with the documentary is it's I kind of felt like there's we talk a lot about like the, the negative stuff that is involved with with being Japanese and Japanese identity. But I also thought that a lot of the people I talked to, they seem like, you know, just pretty normal, happy people. Right. Mm -hmm. Like. They, they might have had had an identity struggle or they might be still struggling with their identity, but that's not like their whole life. Their whole life is not just this, you know, identity thing. They're, they're doing like lots of other things. There are many different things. It's kind of like what um, Tetsuro was saying, the guy who wrote the Hafu to Hafu book. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's, um, you can be more than just, you know, Japanese. You could also be a soccer player. You could be also, like he's Belgian, you can be Belgian as well. You can be a man, you can be a father, you can be, you know, like so many different things. Or maybe Bobby was saying that too. I don't know. Uh, a lot of people said very similar things, but, um, you know, as important as identity is, and I made a documentary about identity, it's, it's just one part of your, your life and it's not everything. So um, I guess I didn't want people to think that it was a big negative, like um, being not seen as totally Japanese, like there could be a totally positive aspect to it. And maybe it's just um, time will change things part as well. But I feel like for, for my kids growing up, um, I don't worry so much about them, you know? Mm -hmm. Like I think times have changed, at least in Tokyo enough that I feel like yeah, they'll, they'll be fine in, in Tokyo growing up as whatever they are, you know, whether, whether they're considered Hafu or whether they're considered Canadian or they're just considered normal Japanese or whatever type of, you know, identity you want to put on them. You know, they're also just they're, they're their own selves, right? They're just, you know, Aiko and Shintaro, you know, like they're just themselves, just like Bobby and Elena, you know. <laughs> All right, so at this point, um, I think I want to see if there are any questions from our audience today uh, for you guys. Um, and it looks like, um, you know, we have some folks that have commented in the, the chat, but, um, you know, if you guys have any questions for our panelists today, for Bobby, Elena, or Greg, um, feel free to enter them in now. Um, and certainly, uh, as we wait for any questions from the audience to come in. Um, I do have uh, an additional question, um, and that is, um, you know, I've been watching the Olympics over the, the last week or so, right? And um, so the Olympics are always interesting because you see the makeup of the athletes that are representing their country, and Japan's um, athletes um, are actually quite diverse, you know, uh, much more so than I would have expected, you know, even like a decade ago, right? And uh, do you guys feel like uh, the representation um, in the athletes uh, competing for Japan is uh, sort of a reflection of the current state of Japanese society uh, as far as its diversity, or is it somewhat uh, exaggerated? Um, and how do you guys feel like the, 
the makeup of um, you know that sort of diversity in the the team um, received by uh, Japanese folks? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's really interesting, especially like when I was watching like the rugby match. <laughs> like, I was like, huh, yeah. I mean, in the rugby World Cup, it's the same thing, I guess. Um, and a friend of mine from Tonga, uh, well, from Tonga, was saying like, yeah, actually. Recently, a lot of Tongans and uh, Pacific Islanders have been recruited to Japan, you know, to play rugby, and then, like, they essentially get become Japanese to have careers there. And I think it's totally fine. It's like, yeah, that's uh, every other country does it for <laughs> baseball, basketball, whatever. Um, but I think what's kind of what's interesting to see is like the public response, and with like it might seem forced like mm -hmm. on the media where it's like uh, Japan's not necessarily a country where you do that, where you just say like, Hey, this is who I am. Like, um, and so with the Olympics, right. That's the biggest stage to show and uh, represent. Right. So I think there is a, a conflict here in Japan. Um, just with like how much can you show and then how accurate is it because as far as i know when i was looking at the athletes from japan uh very few are like openly zainichi or mm. if any zainichi at all right because they're technically not japanese and um very few okinawans not many so i think the image is pleasing to a lot of people, especially people who don't live in Japan. But I don't know if it's necessarily accurate. Mm -hmm. um, I just remember, I mean, I think they're overrepresented. Like, I guess, I don't know, non-typical Japanese are overrepresented in the Olympics. Um, but... It's probably, I, I think, you know, from a Canadian perspective, I think it's probably a good thing because then if they do well and they're proud of them, they're like, oh yeah, cool. Like they're Japanese. And then I guess it becomes harder to tell other people who are not, you know, typical Japanese that they're not Japanese because they're not a sports star. Um, I know for the Canadian Olympics and other sports, there's so many people who came to Canada like as a refugee or just a regular immigrant or something, and they start competing for Canada, and we wholeheartedly embrace them like, yeah, we won, you know, gold medal. And even <laughs> if a Canadian becomes a different nationality, we still kind of try to claim those medals from those Canadians as well, the former Canadians. Um, so I think we're pretty open about that. Um, but I, I don't know what it's like in Japan from the regular Japanese population. But I, I do know this one moment. Um, and, we, you know, we were just watching Naomi Osaka, like, uh, uh, playing tennis. And um, I guess it's not a spoiler because it's, you know, a few days after. But, like, but she, she didn't make it through, you mm -hmm. know, past the second round of tennis. And when I saw that, like, I was really cheering for her. And when I saw her lose that match, I was kind of heartbroken. Um, yeah. And it's not really because I care. I don't really care about tennis that much. I'm not really that big into sports, mm -hmm. but I just know there was so much pressure on her. And then she was the flag bearer or not the, not, not the flag bearer. That was really Hachimura, but she, you know, lit the torch was huge, mm -hmm. you know, symbolic role. And so she was spotlighted there. And so I felt like if she won gold, then she'd kind of like, you know, prove, yeah, she was worth it that she's, you know, had what it takes and that, you know, anything she had done in the past would be kind of like, you know, minimized. But if she didn't win gold or at least medal, then they'd be like, yeah, that's because of, you know, any type of reason. And then you saw the backlash on social media, at least. I don't know how that, how representative that is of like the regular Japanese population, but mm -hmm. all the nasty comments you would see about her because of, you know, she lost a tennis match. It just seems so ridiculous. And I don't know, it just, yeah, I was like, man, that sucks. I really wish, you know, she would have done you know, being able to get, you know, the gold for Japan, just, it just would have made things a little bit smoother, easier, you know? Sure. All right. Well, I, it looks like we're um, kind of running a little bit longer than uh, we anticipated, which is fine because we're, we're having a great discussion here. Uh, but I think uh, we did get two questions from the audience uh, from uh, Emily, 
So why don't we close out the Q&A with those two questions. Um, I'll actually start with Emily's question for Elena. Um, and that is, uh, when you were in Japan, was there a gender difference uh, in terms of men and women in your group? Uh, was it easier for women than men to be accepted by Japanese society? Um, I didn't notice necessarily anything by gender, but um, when I think back on like the people that I was close with in Japan who were in our group, um, I get the sense that it feels like more men, like it, they would experience like not fitting in to society or, um, and maybe they wouldn't talk about it with other people so much um, until they got to our group. Um, I got the sense from some people that maybe it was, there's a lot bottled up, mm. especially from middle school and um, childhood. Um, maybe it's like bullying experiences. Um, so when often when I would talk to men who went through the um, experience of childhood or middle school, not living in Japan, it seems like there's a lot of intensity. Hmm. Uh, whereas maybe females, like maybe they could, they had friends that they could um, maybe talk about these things. But that's an interesting question. I never really thought about it based on gender thanks uh it looks like we had uh, an additional question come in from glennis so let's squeeze that in before we go to emily's last question um and so glennis's question is uh do you think that japan's reluctance to embrace diversity and inclusion is related to its social framework um slash its need for strong homogenous mindset in order to maintain order and harmony so in other words, uh, fundamental caution about being different uh, as a fundamental source of conflict. Uh, I think I can add a couple points to this. And these are from things that got cut out of the documentary. Mm -hmm. One was that I was supposed to interview uh, an academic that did a lot of research into Japanese you know, racial identity and ethnicity and that kind of stuff. and guess what his you know rough summary is that japan was never really homogeneous in the past mm -hmm. and this is like before the meiji era like you couldn't even talk to another japanese in a different like prefecture or a different clan or there wasn't even pre prefecture like in a different clan because they just didn't speak the same japanese so you have to write you know kanji and stuff to communicate and so i thought that was pretty surprising like even 150 years ago like you couldn't just talk to another Japanese person and expect to be understood. Um, but it was starting with the, you know, Commodore Perry coming over, um, you know, the, the U.S. ships opening up, kind of opening up Japan, that they started to get the mentality is like, you know, eat or be eaten. And so they thought, OK, we have to, like, be strong and be strong enough not to be colonized. And the way that we see the Western world doing this is we have to colonize the rest. So we're going to colonize kind of Asia. And that's kind of where it kept on building up, building up, building up until, you know, the end of World War II, where, yeah, that strategy wasn't working anymore, obviously. Um, but, you know, with that build up, like kind of everyone's Japanese, the idea started happening more and more, like when they took over Taiwan, okay, they're Japanese now. When they, they took over parts of Korea, like, okay, yeah, they're Japanese now. But then after the war, they're like, oh, OK, so they're they're not Japanese anymore. It's like it's it's weird. And then this like whole idea of, OK, we're, we're all Japanese. We're all the same. It's still like I mean, it, it built up to that point. And then at, from um, the point where the researcher was saying that it really actually happened, where Japanese started be really becoming alike was with the mass media. So like in the 1950s and 1960s with technological improvements where everybody can see the same NHK announcer who was speaking the same, you know, standard Japanese and they can all, you know, like be one and have the same news and have the same education system throughout the whole country and um, the same food programs, the same, like everything. And um, that's really when you started becoming a lot more homogeneous culturally 
um, was after World War II and it kept on ramping up. But like, I think it's it, my, my feeling from the research and from talking with people is that it's never really been homogeneous ever, right? But in comparison to Western countries, it's, it is it is very homogeneous country. So it's, it's hard to say it like it's not, but it, it is at the same time. Um, I didn't see the rest. I, 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 oh, I guess it's in the answered, but, uh, oh yeah. So the other part of it was politicians. Um, they definitely wanted to, um, yeah, they were talking about making sure that the society stays harmonious, right? That's the big word, right? They wanted harmonious society, no conflict. And so it seemed people were very wary of accepting different things because it would kind of break that harmonious nature of Japan. So I think that's a big reason why it's kind of shot away from. Sure. Yeah, I'm just going to touch on like what Greg was saying with the colonization. I think it's, it's not just Japan, like it's America, it's, I mean, it's China now. <laughs> like, I mean, any very strong power, like semi-authoritarian power right it's gonna try to eliminate a lot of resistance and they want a brand so like america would be like white christian and then china would be han chinese japan would be yamato tamashi like like it's like this false idea of you know purity and supremacy and stuff and so i think that still continues um but we just have to like fight it with awareness and, uh, you know, I guess acceptance and um, just trying to get people involved in communities and talking about it. And yeah, I just want people to remember that. <laughs> All right. Um, Elena, any thoughts? Um, well, this is a little bit this is a little bit Japantown specific, but I just kind of wanted to somehow get this in here before, you know, we end the panel discussion. But, um, you know, I was talking about Japantown, like being a place where we don't have to think about if we're American or we're Japanese. But um, a lot of people that I've spoken to, um, like I, especially people who aren't, who haven't uh, in their family uh, history experience the incarceration they've come to japan towns or like japanese american communities in america and not felt like their story really meshes into the community um so in the sense that you know maybe me being in japan i would get like weird questions like um like questioning my japanese-ness right um people in japan town um, like one of my friends, uh, she was born in Japan and then moved to America, right? Um, she would get questions from Japanese Americans who were born in America uh, saying like, where, where were you born? Where are you from? Like that kind of question. And then they would keep prying until they eventually, eventually said, oh, I was born in Japan. And they're like, oh, I thought so. So they can, they can see that there's a difference, right? Like, so I, I guess in general, um, I guess we can, we can all kind of try to be more, like, less alienating of people, you know, and think about, like, when we're talking to people, like, how can we, like, bring them in versus kind of, like, push them away, because um, having a community is a really beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to bring that up. Certainly. Oh, okay. And I think at this point, uh, why don't we try uh, wrapping up uh, the panel discussion, but um, Bobby, if you have any parting thoughts, please go ahead and share them and then we'll finish up with Greg and uh, you can answer the, the final question from the audience uh, as well, Greg, uh, which is, um, you know, what are your plans for the documentary going forward? Will it be uh, going on a college circuit or film festivals, you know, uh, where else might uh, people be able to catch it? Uh, but why don't we uh, go with, with Bobby first. Uh, any final thoughts that you'd like to leave us with today? Yeah, it was a really fun project and I'm glad that like 
you know, Greg had me involved. Uh, I was really surprised, <laughs> like when we contacted him, that he even responded. Honestly, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, it was really fun. I think it's a great, great film. Um, yeah, and I'm looking forward to like you know, maybe meeting other people in the film someday. Um, and yeah, being like a filmmaker myself, I guess like I just want to continue with this theme too of like uh, Japanese culture identity and you know the future of this country too. So, yeah, thanks, Greg. Appreciate it. <laughs> thanks, Bobby. Yeah, I mean, I was just really, you know, touched and impressed with all the people that did get in touch with me and help me make the documentary. Because if you looked at the credits, there's so many people that helped out. Um, so even though, like, I say, like, oh, yeah, I, I, this is my documentary. I made the documentary. Really, it was a huge community of people that... Um, you know, either helped me behind the scenes and were never seen on camera, or they were, you know, on camera sharing their stories, intimate stories, personal stories about themselves, um, and, you know, allowing me to do so and trusting me to do so. So I have to say thanks to everyone involved. Um, and in terms of what is the future of the documentary, where can it be seen? Um, it can always be seen right now on Vimeo. So that's Vimeo slash on Vimeo.com slash on demand slash being Japanese. Um, it's available for only purchase right now, but it will be available for rent starting August 13th. So it'll be, I guess, a lot more accessible at a rental price point than re- cur- it currently is. Um, and then eventually after a year or two, it will be on YouTube free for anyone to see. And the big reason for that was because I know, I feel like a lot of documentaries get made and then they just kind of like sit on the shelves, get all dusty and very few people get to see it. And um, I just wanted people to actually see this and have like a better understanding of them, them like themselves are the people they're interacting with. And especially actually is the you know, a regular, you know, quote unquote, people living in Japan, the average Japanese person living in Japan, I would love for them to be able to see this documentary and understand much more about the diversity that's within Japan and the different people, Japanese people that are living amongst them. Um, And as for the film circuit, our festivals, people, um, our college tours and stuff like that, I had originally wanted to do like different, you know, like go to like a theater show, the documentary, then have like, you know, the audience ask questions in real life. I thought that would have been super cool to have and even have a couple of panelists from like different areas come to and that would have been really cool with the pandemic. It just, it doesn't seem like it's anything easy to do. So I don't have any plans for any in-person events virtually if people, you know, ask me, I would, you know, love to do it. Um, and I don't know for film festival, I I might try to do some stuff just because to raise awareness more than anything, not to win an awards, but just to kind of help get the message out because, uh, like, I, like I said, I would love the regular Japanese people to see this, which is, which is why this is a bilingual documentary. Um, but interestingly, when I've showed this to people who are not at all like Japanese, they can still identify that with, you know, the people in the documentary. So I thought I found that so interesting. Like, even though there's like, you know, a Russian, you know, Vietnamese person, they're like, yeah, I can relate this documentary. And um, I thought that was kind of cool. Like it's like, it's a global, even though it's about Japanese identity, it's still about kind of global, like this, like, you know, how to be you in this, you know, modern world, you know? Well, I think, um, you know, that kind of, puts it on a, you know, that also right there for us to, to really ponder over as we go forward, you know, it's like, you know, how do we define ourselves and realizing that, you know, our own identities, you know, just like the rest of this world are, you know, it's very complex, but um, I really, really enjoyed today's discussion. And I want to thank all of our panelists here, Bobby, Elena, and Greg, uh, for coming on and, you know, sharing with us your experience and who you are. I really appreciate it. And I certainly would like to thank the rest of the audience for joining us today. So uh, with that being said, uh, we're at the conclusion of our program today. I really hope that everyone enjoyed it and 
also that you um, encourage other people to watch Greg's uh, documentary, Being Japanese. Um, and I think it would be really great for other people to, um, you know, watch it and examine their own identities and, um, you know, try to figure out where they too uh, might fit into this whole spectrum of what it means to be a Japanese person in this world. So uh, with that being said, um, really want to thank everyone again and encourage you guys all to, uh, if you are in the San Francisco Bay Area, to come by to the center in San Francisco, Japantown at some point and uh, see what uh, we have going on. But uh, in the meantime, we'll continue to bring you uh, virtual programs as well. So uh, really appreciate everyone's time and uh, hope that we see you again soon. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good one. Bye.